afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the King and Pocket Aces brought to you by Rotoballer.com. I'm one of your hosts, Anthony Aniano, Pocket Aces, and joining me as he does each and every week on this show, Hall of Famer and King of Fantasy Sports, Mr. Scott Angle. Scott, it's mid-July. We're another week closer to fantasy football. Drafts kicking off, already right, kicking off, NFL season closing in. How are you doing, my friend? Doing good, doing good. Just to set something straight. I did not give myself the, this nickname. Who did There's give it to you? There that I did, but I did. Who did? My original, my original producer on Sirius XM, Mike Demerges, gave me this nickname. And, and it is, very rarely does a nickname stick as well yeah. as, as yours has stuck. So, so well earned, right? They give you the nickname, but you got to earn to keep it, and you did it. So uh, follow Scott on Twitter at Scott E. The King. And follow me on Twitter at A Aniano Fantasy. And guys, what we're gonna do today? We're gonna to talk something, though, Anthony. I don't mean to interrupt you, though. I'm the king of fantasy sports. You know, there's the king of basketball. That's LeBron James. The king of of racing is Richard Petty. So you have to make sure you're in the, in the right pathway. I understand. I understand. So you you rule from the throne of fantasy sports. Understandable, Scott. Yes. Um, <laughs> I guess I, I guess that would make me like the court jester, so I'm okay with that uh, as well. But um, I, Scott, I, I do not think so. No. Boy, thank you, thank you. We have uh, we have a lot to talk about today as as drafts are approaching. I want to talk uh, some running backs for a good portion of the show with you. Uh, towards the end of the show, we'll break down a few players whether to keep or not keep. Not dynasty leagues, just your standard. However, keeper league people run, you know, two, three, four keepers rounds, whatever it may be, but. First thing I wanted to hit you with uh, is a draft day strategy question. And that question is the zero running back philosophy, right? We've been in drafts, FSGA drafts have, have gone down, Scott Fishbowl drafts, which is a little bit different because it's two QB league. But really the FSGA drafts, we saw in 12 team leagues or 14 team leagues, as many as 10 running backs go in the first round, right? A, a heavy load of running backs. But there's always the zero running back theory that floats around that people could get running backs late. They could stream them late. I want to take your, get your take on what zero running back means. And if it's a, it's, if it's a philosophy, you think you could win a fantasy football league with. There are many different ways to attack the draft, but I don't subscribe to any one theory because what I always say, and you'll see this upcoming on Seahawks.com. You know, I talk about, my 12 tips for fantasy football success upcoming this week. Uh, you know, I'll talk about how there's no preset plan in order to attack a draft. Now, we've been talking about some of these plans for years. Back in the days when Michael Fabiano was at NFL.com, he, he employed what he called the Falk strategy, which is uh, he went three running backs in the first three rounds because running backs were so in demand. Then we heard about the zero running back theory and to me you just can't go can't go into a draft uh with a preset plan you can go into with a skeleton of a plan a shell of a plan but in order to say say i'm going to do this this and this it just doesn't work that way you got to let the draft come to you you got to go with the flow every draft is different you're sitting with 19, uh, not 19, that's a large league. Uh, I don't know what I was going to say there. You sit with, 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 like, with like 13 or 11 other people, and every single draft is different. It's 13, 11 to 13 different thought processes. You never know who's going to get picked ahead of you. You could tell me, well, I know the draft's going to go like this, and maybe once in a while you're right, but you can't really predict what's going to happen ahead of you after the first round. Uh, what values might fall to you, what players might get sniped from you. You, you got to adjust on the run. Let's forget about all these pre-planned strategies. The way to execute a successful fantasy football draft is prepare yourself to go with the flow. Prepare yourself for a roller coaster. Prepare yourself to be ready for hairpin twists and turns where you're switching your mind from different players in different positions at the drop of a hat because no draft is going to go like you planned. It's all about being in the moment, being in the mix, being
be prepared, be mentally confident, be mentally comfortable to adjust on the run. I don't believe in any preset draft strategies whatsoever. Now, I agree with you, but understand there are people, and, and I guess the point being is here, Scott and I don't agree with the philosophy, who walk into a draft with that plan. I am not drafting a running back for the first X amount of rounds, okay? We, we've seen it in drafts, and, and, and I don't think it's a winning strategy to our viewers. Scott agrees with me. I don't necessarily think, you know, to, to Scott's point, you know, you could say zero running back until Alvin Kamara slides to pick five for you, and then what are you doing? You, you, you got to take the best player. That, that's the, the, the point. Um, don't lock yourself in to a zero running back philosophy. That's the take from, from Scott and I. Now, look, there are some high stakes players that are much more successful than me that might employ this and it might work for them. It's just, it's not something that I personally do. And if you're playing in one fantasy, one of, one of those listeners and viewers that play in one fantasy league, two fantasy leagues, uh, I think it's a very unique strategy. And I'm not saying some people can't make it work, but I think it's a higher level strategy. But you also push yourself into a sort of box and take more risks. Yeah, you could end up with, say, Tyreek Hill, Devontae Adams, and Allen Robinson have a great receiving crew. But then who are your running backs? And then you're going to have to hit it up on waivers, et yeah. cetera. To me, best available player to fill out the need. That's what I personally prefer. But again, there are many different ways to attack a draft. I don't recommend it, but there's some people who can make it work and make a good case for it. There's no one way to draft, but I don't like I don't like to walk in with a preset plan. Fair enough. I agree with you. Now, now, as we talk more running backs, one of the hot button running backs of the offseason due to injury last season, and now some coach speak this offseason is Saquon Barkley. Okay. Um, now I laugh, right? I, I go on Twitter and some of our roto baller uh, uh, co-workers have used the term fade Saquon Barkley. Okay. When you say fade a player, in my opinion, fade is hundred percent, Scott, the wrong word to use. If you're still drafting him in the first round. Okay. You're not fading somebody. If you're still taking them at one nine. Okay, let's let's just be honest about this. Fade That's is not a fade. Fade is a void. It's a DFS term. Right. But they use, and I've seen it all week since we last, or fade Saquon Barkley. No, you're not fading him. You're just not taking him in the first five picks of the draft. Okay, there's a big difference between fading and, and sliding him back to the first round of the draft. Now, his name I saw come up over and over and over again over the last week. So I want to ask you, a couple of weeks ago, the Giants coaching staff came out and they said, I don't know how much we'll be able to use Saquon early in the season. We're going to potentially limit his workload. Now, what does this limit mean? Does it mean 12 carries instead of 20? Who knows? We don't know. It's a big word. All right. Saquon Barkley, if it's August 15th, about a month from now, you and I are sitting in a draft. How are you? Are you avoiding Saquon Barkley or like any player, in my opinion, there comes a point where you can't avoid him anymore because his value is just too good coming off this ACL injury. It's interesting because uh, this past weekend, and you should listen to it on demand on the SXM app or on Sirius XM online, uh, Michael Florio and I on our Saturday Roto Bowler show had on Chris uh, Bisignano from Giants Insider to ask him about Saquon Barkley. And he said, he believes Barkley's going to be ready for the regular season and they're going to limit his workload in the first four weeks, about 17, 18 touches a game, and then ramp it up. Now, with 17, 18 touches per game, as Mike said, and I agree with him, Saquon Barkley can do a lot with that because yes. he can score from anywhere on the field. At the same time, Chris from Giants Insider said, and I agree with him, people – say back and forth, oh, it was a major knee injury. Barkley's not an injury concern, but Chris said, look, he's missed a lot of games over the last two years. Now, Barkley, if he plays every week, he could end up being the number one running back in fantasy football. 
McCaffrey's number one, but Cook and and Barkley have more big play ability than than uh than McCaffrey. They're not as dependent on volume. Their ceilings are to be the number one running back in fantasy football. But I do have health concerns with Barkley, and that's why he's not quite in my top five. He's just outside of it. The upside is there to be the top running back in fantasy football. 17, 18 touches a game, that's still a lot. And on one play, Saquon Barkley, boom, he could be gone more than anybody in the league. The difference between him and Cook is, I think Cook is more electric and dazzling and can make people miss in terms of style and is maybe the prettiest running back in the in the game to watch, whereas Barkley is the biggest danger to score from anywhere on the field. There's probably more upside with Barkley than any other running back in fantasy football. But as the late, great Chris Dolman used to tell me, the Hall of Famer, and uh, may you always rest in peace, Chris. Uh, really enjoyed working with you and talking to you learn football from you. Some players are just more injury prone than others. It is in their DNA. And, you know, that, that might be the case with Barkley. I just, I have more health concerns with him than I do a lot of other running backs. Uh, Dalvin Cook, look, Frank Imarante of Roto Bowler said, we had the same concerns about Cook last year. And we're taking Cook number two this year. You want to take Barkley number two or three, I'm not going to argue with it. But the last two years, we've seen Barkley miss a lot of games, where we saw Cook play most of the schedule last year. So you feel a little bit more reassured naturally. But if somebody wants to take Barkley top three or top four, I'm not going to argue with that. But I think he's going to get ramped up. But I don't think it's going to be enough early in the season that's going to be 12, 13 touches to the point where you're that concerned. Right. See, and that's, that goes back to the point. If he's getting 15 touches a game, that said, to me. 18. Right. So I'm even downplaying what he said a little bit to 15. That is not a workload that's going to scare me away from somebody, right? I agree with what you're saying. I'm, I'd be more scared of the fact that I haven't, he's been limited the last two seasons. Two years ago, it was the ankle. Last season, it was the knee. You want to take that angle and say, partly that's what I'm afraid of. That's fine. But if, if a limited workload is 15, 16, 17 touches, break it down. Maybe it's 12 carries, four or five receptions. That's not a limited workload that's going to scare me away, Scott. No, and you're trying to get me to say, you know, angle, angle. What's angle's angle on this? You know, it's, uh, I agree with you. So, so if you're sitting outside the top five, let's say you, let's say you pull pick one seven. Saquon coming off the board to you there? It's a possibility. I've seen yeah. Taylor and, and Cam Akers go there, and I might lead slightly in that direction because I'm a little less worried about health with those guys. Okay. Uh, you know, we did see Akers injured last year, but still, you know, it wasn't a normal it wasn't a normal rookie season. But if anybody wants to take Barkley over either one of those second year running backs, I'm not concerned about it because if Barkley stays healthy, he's gonna catch way more passes than Jonathan Taylor. Yeah. And uh, I think he's gonna be more explosive than Cam Akers. And again, I can make a case of taking Akers over Taylor. So it's in that within that mix. I don't know if he's going to score as many touchdowns as Ezekiel Elliott or rush for as many yards as Nick Chubb. So you're splitting hairs. And the one thing that can bump him down slightly to the bottom of that list is the health concerns. Right. Now, remember, the Giants did not bring in a huge backup running back. Devonta Booker right now is slated to be the backup. So once he's fully healthy, it is the Saquon Barkley show. For the New York you Giants. have to consider Booker, though, because if Barkley goes down, the word is that the Giants like Devontae Booker a lot, and they feel that he can do what Wayne Goldman did last year if he gets turned to. Okay. But nonetheless, he's not a threat for carries to a healthy Saquon Barkley. This is not no, a, they're, a they're, this they're, is not a time even remotely close to a timeshare situation in New Jersey. No, it's not. And, you know, there's talk about they they don't like Barkley's pass blocking. And that's true. But at the same time, they can't take him off the field on third down because 
they want to throw the ball to him. So right now, you look at my ranks on rotoballer.com, and they're updated. And you can get him as part of our fantasy football season pass. Enter King at checkout for a special discount. McCaffrey won Dalvin Cook, Henry 3, Kamara 4, Chubb 5, Elliott 6, Taylor 7, Cam Akers 8th, and Gibb, and uh, and Saquon Barkley ninth right now. Okay. Okay. I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that. Let's talk about Ezekiel Elliott, though, for a minute, Scott, who's been actually climbing up ADPs of late. You see it in on Rotobola.com's rankings. He's gone up about three spots on average in ADP. He's now cracked the top five. Uh, McCaffrey won on the Rotobola rankings, Cook two, Derrick Henry three, and there's Zeke Elliott. People were down on Elliott last year. There are some people who think Tony Pollard is the better running back in Dallas. I don't agree with that statement, but they think uh, Tony Pollard is the better running back than Zeke Elliott. Um, but Zeke Elliott sits there right now in the Roto Bowler rankings at number four, ahead of Alvin Kamara. Are you all in with Zeke Elliott now emerging as a top five pick at the running back position? Yeah, I have ranked fifth, like I just said. Uh, you know, last year he had the most carries and highest percentage of carries inside the five yard line, but he only had six touchdowns because the defenses knew what was coming. Who else mm-hmm. are they going to give the ball near the goal line? Now you have healthy Dak. You have the best three wide receiver crew and maybe the best overall offense in the NFL. They're going to be less predictable near the goal line, and they're going to have a ton of scoring opportunities that they didn't have last year. Plus, look, you hear a lot of positive talk at this at this point of the year coming out of camps. This guy looks great. That guy looks great. But there was a story in The Athletic about how Ezekiel Elliott is working with the same trainer that helped Leonard Fournette regain his mojo before the playoffs last year, and how Zeke is just he's just looking different fundamentally. And mm-hmm. that excites me when it comes to Ezekiel Elliott. There's going to be a lot of volume. There's going to be a lot of touchdowns. But can he regain his efficiency? I think that's a possibility. Okay. Let's slide out of the top 10 here for a little bit because I think everybody knows what they like up top of a draft. And talk about Antonio Gibson of the Washington football team. Second round pick on average. Some people are super high on him as a potential three down back for the Washington football team. Uh, Last season, just over a thousand yards. Nice season. Ryan Fitzpatrick at the helm now for the Washington football team. Is the hype train too big on Antonio Gibson or are we, are we seeing someone who's going to be a terrific draft day pick in the second round? I was wrong on Antonio Gibson last year. I, you know, Mike Florio was right. I'll give him the credit. He thought that he could be a touchdown maker as a rookie. I said, you know, scoring near the goal line is something that, uh, you know, it's not as easy as it looks. You have to have body lean. You have to be able to make yourself small. Gibson learned all those things very quickly. And he was raw coming out of last year. He was a receiver in college. They're going to get him more involved in the passing game. This offense should be better under Ryan Fitzpatrick uh, because in terms of producing points, because he'll move the, the team into scoring position, but also throw red zone interceptions and, you know, be erratic. So they'll be involved in some high scoring games. And I think he'd be very involved in this offense. I love him as a third round pick. Uh, I have him as my 10th rank running back. I think he's an ideal target as an RB too. There you go. So what about Joe Mixon? Now, Joe Mixon has teased, tantalized, taunted, and usually disappointed, right? Let's be honest. He's everything he, he is everything we've wanted him to be until he's not. And then he lets us down. Now, Gio Bernard's out. It is legitimately, if there's any running back who has less competition for carries and touches, I, I need somebody to name him because right now it's just Joe Mixon. Uh, Samaji P. Ryan is there. I'm not even remotely considering that name. But can we trust it? Right? Isn't that always the question with Joe Mixon? To go as your second running back? Or if you go wide receiver early, now you're saying Joe Mixon's my RB1? I mean, you're, are you setting yourself up for just complete the heartbreak there? That offense is going to be very busy. The defense is still not good. Barrow's going to throw a lot. There's going to be a lot of scoring opportunities. There's going to be opportunities to catch passes out of the backfield. 
I like Mixon as a high end RB two. Uh, when the Bengals were really bad a few years ago, I gained more admiration for him because they were bad and he was working hard for every single yard. He is a high effort running back that is going to make the most of every touch. As long as he's healthy and as long as he's out there, I don't know if I like him as an RB one. I think Burrow is going to throw a lot, but I do like him as a high end RB two. Okay, so here's my question for you. A running back in a similar situation on an offense, an offense that's going to play from behind quite a bit, although DeAndre Swift has a little more, uh, Jamal Williams is there. But again, a situation where DeAndre Swift could be a real feature point of that Lions running back core. As your RB2, who do you have more faith in this year? A Joe Mixon or a DeAndre Swift? I mean, I barely have DeAndre Swift in my top 20. Wow. It's not close for me. Because wow. I'm, I'm, I'm not big on DeAndre Swift this year because potential volume plus talent doesn't always translate into fan, optimum fantasy production. He's going to get the opportunity, but we all know what kind of volume he's ticketed for and how often they might give him the ball. Well, every defensive coordinator knows that, too. There's going to be a big X right on his chest because they are lacking talent in Detroit. And every defense is going to be like, let's stop DeAndre Swift and make everybody else beat us. It's very simple. It's Swift and Hawkinson, and we're not worried about anybody else. He is going to face stack fronts. And when they're playing from behind, and they're behind 28 to 10, Throwing him swing passes out of the backfield is not going to be the way to catch up. I think that he's on a bad team in a bad situation, and it's going to lead to disappointing production. What about Miles Sanders then? Another running back who's in a people like because of the the role he has in Philadelphia. Now, I think Miles Sanders is honestly an overrated player. I really do. He's disappointed, in my opinion, two seasons in a row. He catches a few passes. I'll give him that. But to me, that Eagles offense uh, is almost as uncertain as any other offense in the league. Jalen Hurts, you're hearing rumors that they, the Eagles, uh, Adam, Adam Kaplan brought up on uh, the other day that uh, they might be in the mix with Deshaun Watson in Philadelphia. The wide receiver core is young. And then there's Miles Sanders there. He's another player. I, I would actually trust him even maybe less personally than DeAndre Swift. I trust Joe Mixon more. But I have Miles Sanders even after DeAndre Swift. That's how little faith I have in Philadelphia's ability to use him correctly. I have Joe Mixon at 14. I have DeAndre Swift at 19 in my ranks at rotoballer.com. I have Miles Sanders at 20. I believe he's overrated. Another, another example of an opportunity doesn't always turn into optimism from production. Miles Sanders is a big scat back. He likes to dance and try to make people miss. He's not a consistently proficient goal line runner. He drops passes. He fumbles. And that offense is very shaky. If I have to take Miles Sanders in my RB2, I'm not feeling too good about it. Okay. I'm going to throw a team at you, Scott. I'm going to play a little game. I'm going to throw a team at you. You tell me from that team, who is the running back to draft that you see or becoming the, 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 the better fantasy option from that team? Denver Broncos, who is the best fantasy option at running back? Ryan O'Halloran of the Denver Post told us a few weeks ago that he believes that Javante Williams is going to emerge as a starting running back there. Uh, it's going to happen at some point. You know, Melvin Gordon's on a, the final year of his contract, and Javante Williams was great at breaking tackles in college, gaining gaining yards. Uh you know, gaining extra yardage, et cetera. Uh, I think Denver's very excited about him. I, I prefer Javante Williams for more upside. Jacksonville Jaguars. It's going to be a timeshare there. Uh, and I have them very closely ranked together. ETN's going to be the kind of guy that can score on any given play. And he'll catch passes out of the backfield. But Robinson is going to be more of a lead ball carrier and a touchdown option. That answer is going to be different every single week. I, I want to avoid these guys as anything more than a flex in a seasonal league. 
It could be one week, Robinson rushing for 120 yards and two touchdowns, and the next yard, next week, ETN catching a 75-yard catch and run for scrimmage for a touchdown and scoring another short yardage touchdown. So the answer is there. I prefer ETN for more upside, but Robinson is the safer pick. One last team, and then we'll go to keep, keep or not keep. Arizona Cardinals. Definitely Chase Edmonds. James Conner has had one good year, and we've been overrating him ever since. All Edmonds has to do is stay healthy. He's very versatile, and he's capable of scoring from anywhere on the field. Okay, fair enough. All right, now, Scott, a lot of our listeners, a lot of our viewers, keeper leagues, 12-team, keep three, keep four. They have all different rules on how they work the rounds, okay? I'm going to throw some names at you. Are we keeping them? Or are we not keeping them for this season? Ryan Tannehill. Usually, when you're looking at keepers, if you have two or three, you're not considering the quarterback. But depending on what, if in, in situations where you don't have anybody better than Tannehill as a third keeper, the guy finishes QB7 last year, mm-hmm. and now he gets Julio Jones to go with A.J. Brown. He's underrated. People don't view him as a ceiling quarterback, but he is a very, very steady and reliable starter. So he's not a top-rung keeper, but if you're able to keep him for a round penalty or a 10 or later, I think it's a given. And if you don't have – a lot of people have, like, three keepers. Okay, I can two, keep two very good running backs – and I got a very good wide receiver, it's, you know, I'm not thinking about Tannehill, but then there are situations where you don't have a surefire third keeper if Tannehill's in there. I think you have to consider him. So if I had to grade Tannehill as a keeper on a scale from one to five, I'd say he's a three. Okay. Josh Jacobs. Don't forget Kenyon Drake now there in Vegas at the running back position. Josh Jacobs, keep or not keep? If I had Josh Jacobs as my second running back and I had to keep three, I would consider keeping him. Look at the amount of touchdowns that he scored last year. He's still going to be the lead runner from that offense. He's not viewed as having a high ceiling, but I think he'll be a comfortable RB2. I think people are disappointed because they expected RB1 production out of him, but now he's not going to catch passes out of the backfield. But the overall numbers were still pretty good there. And if you can keep him anywhere from, say, with a round penalty of, say, round four on, I would very strongly consider it. So he's a number three on the scale of five to me again. He's not ideal for me. If uh, if I had three running back keepers and he was the third, I'd throw him back and keep the wide receiver instead. But there's a lot of cases and everybody's individual where I would keep considering Josh Jacobs. He's People are very down on him, but, you know, look how many touchdowns he scored yeah. last year. Cowboys wide receiver Amari Cooper. The question becomes, will he still be Dak's favorite option as C.D. Lamb continues to emerge? Amari Cooper, keep or not keep? If I got the chance to keep Amari Cooper as a wide receiver too, I would very strongly consider it. This is a guy that caught 92 passes last year with Dak Prescott. That was a career high, mostly playing without him last year. People are worried about the toe, but this, you know, I'm not going to be worried about the toe in July. You know, right. I have to look at the toe long term, especially if I'm looking at a keeper league. The guy is capable of being very explosive. Just because Lamb is on the rise doesn't mean that Amari Cooper is going to crash and burn either. You know, this is the best receiving crew in the NFL. He's still very young, still has a lot of talent. So I rate him as a four on a keeper scale. Uh, I think you can keep him as a wide receiver too. People are down on Cooper because they're up on Lamb. It might end up being a mistake. You got to like both. Right. New New York Giants wide receiver one, Kenny Galladay. Two seasons ago, led, leads the league in receiving touchdowns. Last season, an injury played the lost season. Giants pay for him, but he still has Daniel Jones throwing him the ball. Kenny Galladay, keep or not keep? There's Daniel Jones throwing him the ball, but that's better than what he had throwing him the ball two years ago. But he led the NFL in touchdowns with 11. And he played half a season without Matthew Stafford. So, to me, this guy still has high-end wide receiver two potential. To me, as a wide receiver two, he's a definite keeper for me. Okay. Last player on the list. And this one's interesting. At a thin position, the tight end position, 
Okay, Miami's done a lot to improve the wide receiver core there. Okay, uh, Will Fuller, draft picks. But Mike Gazeki, is this the year Mike Gazeki emerges? And are you willing to find out by keeping him for this season? No, I'm done with Mike Gazeki. Uh, you know, we hear about the potential every year, and it doesn't happen. He's big, fast, it's a matchup problem, and he, he just doesn't produce the numbers. It, it, the talent doesn't translate on the field in sort of an Evan Ingram sort of way. And I think he's going to continue to be that Evan Ingram type where he continues to disappoint. He's never had a season like Ingram. So, you know, you mentioned, you mentioned they bring in Fuller and they bring in the rookie Waddle now. Now there's other targets to battle with too. So yeah. I'm totally out on Mike Kosicki. Give me Adam Troutman every day of the week. All right, fair enough. There you go. You heard it from the king himself. What's that? He's a one as a keeper. All right, sounds good. All right, everybody. Guys, don't forget, go back, listen to any of the prior episodes of the King and Pocket Aces as we've been preparing you for your fantasy football drafts. And we'll continue to prepare you throughout the summer months, heading into the season. King and Pocket Aces coming at you each and every week on Rotoballer Radio, rotoballer.com, and wherever you listen to your podcasts. Scott? And don't forget, if you want to get involved in Dynasty, Keeper Drafts, and Best Ball, rotoballer.com slash FFPC. Get a discount on your first team right now. Get involved in Dynasty Superflex. They have all kinds of drafts that are open right now and all kinds of price levels. Yep, and guys, head over to rotoballer.com and sign up now for any of the premium packages. Baseball for the second half. Football, get you ready for and throughout the season. Save some money on those premium packages. Use the promo code KING, courtesy of Scott. Use the promo code ACES, courtesy of me, and get signed up there. Stay right here on the YouTube channel or wherever you listen to the podcast for Roto Bowl Radio. All the great content, sports betting, NASCAR, MMA, esports, PGA, basketball, baseball, and obviously football as well. Scott, this has been fun. Anthony? It's always fun. It's always fun. All right, everybody. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time right here on the King and Pocket Aces. Have a good one, folks.